Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. One thing that gives Age of Empires so much replayability and has given it such a long lifespan online, I think, is how many different and interesting maps there are, and how they all lend themselves to some different strategies. At the end of the day though, there are only so many. Now for HD, there's lots out there on the Steam Workshop, however, most of that can't be played anymore since the 4.0 update. And whether you're on Steam or Voobly, you may not know how to find new maps and how to get them working properly. It may surprise you to learn that there are actually a set of 15 maps separate from the well-known random maps, which we all have access to if we own the game, but most of us don't know very much about them. Here's how you find them. Under Map Style, go to Custom instead of Standard. And then for Location, you now have some new maps to choose from. You can download other ones, like I have Cliff Maze and Gold Rush Forest here that I found on Steam, but I'm just going to be looking at the ES ones. Go check it out, I'm willing to bet that you have these too, whether you play on patch 1.0c, Gold Edition, or HD, and whether or not you have the new expansions. In this video, I'm going to be showing you these maps, and how some can break up the old scripts and strategies that we're all used to, and encourage some new ones, so I'm going to be mostly interested in their potential to do that. Now depending on your skill level and your playstyle, some of what I'm saying may not apply to you, and I'm relying on my experience playing these with Steam players between 1500 and 2000 rating, but hopefully it gives you a sense of whether or not you'd be interested in giving a few of them a try. So let's check them out. Let's go through them alphabetically, starting with canals. Like the name implies, you start with a lot of thin waterways around the map connecting all the players. Players and most resources are all on the outside edges with a forest ring around that. You start with no sheep and one boar, but there are some good areas to dock and fish, so that's where most of your food comes from until you get farms going. Here's a few examples of minimap screenshots. I'll show you a few from each map as we go to give you a sense of the variability in map generations. Now in terms of fairness between players, be aware that you can have some pretty big variability in the distance, both to the closest wood line and to the water itself, which isn't great. Sometimes for a player, either one can be almost within town center range, and for others it can be a really long walk. The middle divisions aren't always fair either, and sometimes a player can be the only one with access and have personal control of a big slice of the middle, with a lot of area to build and some extra resources. In terms of strategies though, it's cool because it feels like a blend of a water and land map. There's not quite enough fish or open water to make it a traditional water map where you have to go for water, but the lack of sheep makes the water canals that much more important, and can let you put pressure on the other player's town with transport landings or directly from ship fire. That being said, it can also be worth trying to go for land and grab the middle of the map, so there's potentially a few ways to play it. Overall, it's okay, but it's not my favorite on the list, so let's move on. The next one is capricious. The word capricious usually describes people who are unpredictable and temperamental. Now the map does have a big element of randomness, so that's probably where the name comes from. Specifically, it seems to vary the amount of gold, stone, and food sources, sometimes giving a huge amount of any or all of them, and sometimes giving less of one of them. It's unpredictable in that you may end up playing a map with ridiculously high food and gold, but almost no stone, or huge amounts of stone and almost no food. You never know. The wood distribution pattern though is consistent, and tends to be medium sized clumps all over the map. In 40 random generations, I found you're never going to have more than one resource be low, but it's entirely possible for them all to be abundant. I wouldn't say it revolutionizes gameplay, but it's a fun and unpredictable map, which makes it one to try if you like open maps, but you're needing a break from the regular old Arabia. The next map is Dingoes. That's a continent sort of map generation, but the biggest selling point is the extra sheep, sometimes 20 or more around your town. There's little extra things around the map, like lots of little skeletons and a bunch of extra wolves in the middle, maybe hence the name. And the craziest part is you start this without a scout. You have water for fishing and a little bit of extra gold and stone, but the trade-off is a wood shortage in the late game, potentially. There's lots of river choke points to wall up, and a big enough landmass around your town that you don't have to worry about range attacks from the water. Britons would be a very solid choice on this map because of the early game, and early scouting of the middle sheep is dangerous, but there's a very high reward if you're lucky. 
By Castle Age, it can serve to turn into a more regular continent sort of map, which is maybe your thing or maybe something you're trying to get away from. Definitely check this one out if you're looking for a map that shakes up the early game. The next one we're going to look at is Graveyards. Now this is the weirdest one yet. A couple of things to know is that this map has lots of relics and it also has these little grave sites around. The grave areas tend to have a bit more gold and some unusual scenario editor trees with 125 wood. Now there are some lakes around with some good fishing and the distribution can be a bit unfair, sometimes giving a player their own private lake or in the case of one game I played, two all to myself. The aesthetics are really the big selling point here, but aside from a bit higher resources and the creepy graveyard areas, it doesn't really encourage outside the box strategies and it's a pretty straightforward open map. For full effect, I would recommend playing it on Unexplored, and maybe on Halloween or something like that. Next up is Metropolis. Now this is the first custom map that I ever really got into. You start with three different towns with your regular starting villagers and resources around each one. You also get a scout at each one, so the beginning involves some hectic micromanagement to get everybody working. Your starting towns also get three times the starting bonuses. So Chinese, for example, start with the regular minus 50 wood and minus 200 food, but they start with an extra nine villagers, three at each town. You might want to consider banning Chinese and Mayans as civilizations from this map. Another feature is always a large lake in the middle with great fishing. It's really intense out of the gate, and for players who like to boom in Castle Age, you get that feeling right away. It's also a bit tougher to rush other people since keeping a player completely garrisoned in one town center doesn't halt their economy at the other two and could even free up their micromanagement a bit. It takes a couple of run throughs of the map to really get a sense of it and even having something like two functional town centers building villagers while the other one ages up is massive for your economy and it's a fun mental workout to keep tabs on three different town centers plus docks while you're trying to keep everybody working during three interconnected dark age builds at the same time. That all being said, after everyone enters Castle Age, it starts to turn into a normal game, and the player with the best early game management skills often comes out ahead. To make things extra fun, you can do it on Regicide and get 3 castles, 30 villagers, and 3 kings. You lose when all 3 kings die. Overall, it's a really fun map, and I highly recommend checking it out. Next up is Moats. It's similar to how it sounds, and you have a water moat around you with a few land bridges. It's definitely not a map that you can hide in your little fortress though, since most of the resources and all of the wood is in the middle. One thing to note is that you can't dock because the moat is deep water, so transport ships are out. Other than that, there's not a whole lot to say about this one actually. It's a land map with normal resources and moats. It seems like a good map for a peaceful diplomacy game more than anything. Next up is Paradise Island. Like Graveyard, the aesthetics are a big selling feature of this one. It's visually different in lots of ways, with mountains, animals, and beaches. But that being said, the gameplay itself isn't too unusual. It plays a lot like an open map with some water around the outside. And the biggest difference is that there's no sheep or turkeys. There are some extra forage bushes to make up for that though, and lots of fish of course, giving it a real tropical vibe. In terms of consistency, the spawn locations can be a little weird, with some of them right on the shoreline within range of galleys, and others quite far inland. I do wish there was a bit more purpose as well to going to the center of the island, but it's just three relics, and there already seems to be a decent amount of gold on the map. Overall, it's a nice themed map, but again offers a pretty standard sort of game. Next one we'll look at is Pilgrims. First of all, I love this map. It's like Nomad, but with an island. The downside is that it's surprisingly laggy. Every time I've played it online, it's lagged, and even on single player with AIs, there's lag. I don't really have a good explanation for that either since it's the only map that does that to me consistently. Sometimes it smooths out online, but in single player it just bugs out, so watch out for that. The main idea is you start off on a small island with 10 villagers and a transport ship, and you have to settle on a massive island where all the resources are. Personally, I prefer to play it explored since it's less confusing for people who haven't seen it to figure out the game plan, but it's basically to land, build a town center, and secure the big island. There's a lot of turkeys and wolves on the island though, which spawn in pairs, so watch out for that. There's a good opportunity for a fish boom, either on the coast of the large island or on your small one, so there can be some water action as well. I've noticed people tend to do better when they coordinate with their team in spreading out a bit, like on a regular nomad, and when you settle closer to the shore rather than too far inland. It gets your town center up faster and gives you water access, which can be pretty important. 
Overall, I find it's a nice twist on the Nomad map type, and if you can play it without lag, then I think it's even more fun than a regular Nomad. Next up is Prairie. This is another map that I really enjoy playing, especially as Mongols, and I can't believe it's not played more often. It's a really open map with very small clumps of trees, and you begin with very few resources around your town and two scouts. In reality, it's not a low resource map though. The mission is to secure the hunting grounds that are located in random locations. Herds can have up to 20 deer and as many as 8 boar, and as you can imagine, in a team game when the map is unexplored, this quickly turns into a scouting race to locate the good spots and mill them, kind of like the food version of Gold Rush. Mongols obviously excel at this, because their hunting bonus and scout line of sight are both perfect for this map. It's not to the point that the game is over automatically if one team secures the free food, but it's just way too much to ignore. Unfortunately, the distribution can be a bit unfair at times, and sometimes a corner player can end up with a personal herd, while several other players have only tiny ones nearby. That might impact the balance of a free-for-all game in particular, but for a team game or one vs one it's always a really fun map to shake things up. The next one is Seasons. Usually this map seems to be a river with a team on each side. In general, I don't really see how it plays different from a salt marsh map, for example. For me, it just doesn't really have an identifiable thing, and the seasons in the name may refer to the fact that sometimes it's wintry, sometimes it's summer, and there's two variations in between. When I saw the name, I was picturing a season on each corner of the map, and I think now that actually might have been cooler. A map with a river in the middle is maybe what you're looking for, and sounds okay on its own, so maybe I'm just expecting too much. The next one is Sherwood Forest. This one has lots of trees, but nowhere to put a great lumber camp since they're all in small clumps around the map. Other than that, the resources are pretty normal, and the biggest thing is that it's hard to find building locations. Keep in mind there are a few lakes scattered around with some big fish, and you might want to dock those. Aside from the weird trees, the biggest change is that you have a hunting wolf as a scout. One pro tip is that if the wolf targets something, it can run quickly. There's also a variation of this called Sherwood Heroes, and it's basically the same except you start with a scout instead of a wolf, and you get a free Robin Hood and Friar Tuck. Now Robin Hood could probably pester another player, and would certainly help in scouting, but it's not overpowered in Dark Age like a hero in Castle Blood, so I could see it making the early game pretty fun. And you could be a bit cheeky with the monk converting some villagers, and it's nice to have a strong archer in the Dark Age. Robin Hood does upgrade as you get text later in the game, so you don't have to worry about him getting outdated, but just be careful that you don't pick up a relic with Friar Tuck, or he's back to being a normal monk. The next one is Shipwreck. In this one, everyone starts in the middle of a very closely packed island, and you have the option of trying to fight for the middle, or quickly moving to the outside ring. There are lots of resources outside the ring, so fighting in the middle isn't necessary to win. There can be large areas of fish, if you're lucky, which makes up for a lack of deer and boar. But the shallows and fish distribution can be really random, so you can't always count on having the same type of coast as another player. I've always found it's a very action-packed map, and it can involve a lot of moving town centers, so it can be a fun one to try, especially in something like a free-for-all. The next one is Team Glaciers. Now this one feels a bit like Highlands, with the ice in the rivers, but it's definitely a more extreme map. The water isn't worth docking since there aren't any fish, and the giant ice sheets in the middle of each open space and along the shores make it really hard to find space to farm. The lack of open space makes the map feel very restrictive, even on very large sizes, and personally I find resources get stuck against trees a lot, way more than on any other map I've seen, even on large map sizes, because everything is so squished by the glaciers. I just feel like there isn't room to do anything on this map, and that's not my cup of tea, but if that's an appealing feature for you and an interesting challenge, then you'll like this map. You'll certainly appreciate all the extra room on a normal map after you play this one. The next one is The Unknown. Now this is a lot like Mega Random if you've ever played that one, but not quite as many random variables. There's a variety of possible map geographies with lakes, islands, rivers, or no water at all. The resources can also be random, and you might end up with a map sort of like what Capricious would give, with extra gold and food, but almost no stone, for example. It's so random, it can border on being unfair though, and one team might start on islands and another with a continent. In generating a few, I even found one map where in a 3 vs 3, player 2 was completely enclosed in trees. You never know exactly what you're going to get with this map, which can make it a lot of fun. 
If you already enjoy being surprised by the map type and going full random, then you might like Unknown for giving you just a little bit less predictability. So that's all of the ES custom maps. There's a ton of other ones online that you can find, but these are the ones that come standard, so everybody already has them. Hopefully at least one of those was enticing enough to get you to want to try it out, but even if none of them did, at least now you don't have to waste your time trying them out for yourself. Win-win, right? Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.